Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, you, you were mentioning about the international conference. Uh, when are you planning uh, the one? In May, May. In May. Okay, okay, okay. 3rd, 4th and 5th of May. Okay. So, okay. Yeah, I will, I will come the, to Nagpur once to meet you. Yes, yes. This was, this will be really a great meeting. We'll just organize a short meeting also. And yeah. uh, what are the topics you are planning so? It's uh, the theme is infertility, ma'am. That's right. Okay. Okay. So, wonderful. 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 And so we have the live surgical uh, means uh, demonstration for the fertility conserving surgeries. Okay. And uh, huh, we are we have the PGs for the workshop on hands-on training for uh, hysteroscopy and pelvic trainers. So okay. Okay. it's a three days conference. Mm -hmm. And uh, our special guest, uh, Dr. Norman Gomez from Spain for the okay. history of school. Yeah. Oh, great, great, great. You're doing really a great, wonderful, 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 wonderful efforts. I think you're uh, heading beyond the foxy, actually. You should. No. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that's a great spirit. Actually, I could see the local body is also performing so well this time now. Uh, yeah. I'm and so yeah, they got a, a awards also. The that is very very praiseworthy for okay. them also. But, but I think uh, uh, we can be uh, when we are together and performing such kind of activities. I think these are very important for the all the fraternity to look forward for the integration purpose point of view. That yes. uh, we are uh, miss uh, uh, making. Some uh, involvement uh, of integration in our pathy so yes. that we provide more better uh, kind of a treatment for our people, especially if it, it comes to infertility, then uh, definitely. Yes. So I this, even feel like this is there should be integration so that uh, the patient will be benefited more, actually. Yes, yes, uh, yes. That should be the agenda. Like, uh, I really believe, like, most of the our, our treatment, like, we always yeah. look into, like, M2 tone will be a better uh, than many other things. Yeah. <laughs> always. Yeah. I, still, it is my, in my pen, like, every other patient where I feel that she needs a menstrual regulation, she should go for this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, ma'am, for appreciating. And, uh, uh, Dr. Jagruti, uh, please request in all the groups to join as uh, our guests already have joined so that we can I mean, start on time. Can we start uh, trying the uh, yes, screen sharing? Let's <laughs> 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 Uh, hello, ma'am. Dr. Shilpi. 
यह गाना कैसे होगा क्योंकि ये दिखता है ना It is clearly visible, ma'am. Hello. Hello. Yes, yes. I have shared the screen. Yes, ma'am. It is clearly visible. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Since morning, I was literally struggling with my videos. They were not able to run in my laptop, so I just. revise them and i uh, wanted to work with them okay uh, if you have you, any it's not uh, there if... yeah, no problem uh, uh, after your explanation we can share it in our group yeah, you... yeah 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 it's there they are there now no problem they are there okay. so anytime i can yes Um, good evening, Dr. Priyanka, ma'am. Should we start or wait for few minutes? Just a one minute, and then you start. Uh, yes. I will send the message in all the group because after seven they will join. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes. So sure. just one minute, and then start, uh, and uh, we will continue. Okay. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.
Jagruti, you can start. Okay, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, so, good evening, everyone. I am I audible, ma'am? Yes, yes, dear. Continue. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, good evening, everyone. I feel extremely glad to welcome everyone to this much-awaited webinar of this blockbuster webinar series by Nima Ojibwe Center. Just a second. You to mute everyone, huh? Yes, 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 ma'am. Before you start, mute everyone. Yes, yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, I feel extremely glad to welcome everyone to this much-awaited webinar of this blockbuster webinar series by Nima Obijiwai Central. Myself, Dr. Jagruti, coordinating today's webinar with Dr. Aarti Nadar. Before starting our session, I request all the dignitaries and all the participants to take a moment for blessings of Lord Dhanvantar. Shankham Chakram Jalaukam Dadatam Rutagatam Charu Durbish Chaturbihi Sukshma Svacha Tirutyam Shukapari Vilasan Mauli Mambu Janetram Palam Budu Jvalangam Katita Tevilasan Charu Pitam Baradyam Vande Dhanvantarintam Nikilagadavanam so, may Lord Dhanvantari bless us all with good health and success. Let us continue and begin this webinar. On behalf of Nima OBGY Central, I welcome to all dignitaries and delegates for today's knowledge enhancing session on the topic of challenges in uterine anomalies. First of all, I welcome Dr. Ashutosh Kulkarni, sir, President of NEMA Central, Dr. U.S. Pandey, sir, Secretary of NEMA Central, Dr. Shantilal Sharma, sir, Treasurer of NEMA Central. Then I would like to welcome Dr. Kamini Dhiman, ma'am, President of NEMA OBGY Central, Dr. Priyanka Nakhle, ma'am, Secretary of NEMA OBGY Central, Dr. Vishnu Bhavne, sir, Treasurer of NEMA OBGY Central, Dr. Rajesh Utne, sir, Convener of NEMA OBGY Central. So, before we go any further, let me give few instructions that are common for all the participants. So, please keep yourself muted during the session. If you are mic uh, found unmuted or disturbing the speaker's voice, you will be either kept in waiting room or removed from the session to maintain decorum of the program. If you have any question, put your question in the chat box or raise your hand during the question and answer series. So dear all, as you know, today's topic is challenges in uterine anomalies. Today we have very, we are very lucky to have here with us a distinguished clinician, Dr. Shilpi Sudmam. Dr. Shilpi Sudmam is consultant and managing director of Safal Hospital and Diva Infertility Center, which is especially running for high risk pregnancy management in fetal medicine, and it is also the advanced fertility and laparoscopic unit. She is also a consultant at Walkert Hospital, Nagpur. She is also past uh, secretary of Indian Infertility Society, Vidarbha chapter. She is also past vice president of uh, Nagpur OBGY Society. She is a faculty at many national and international conferences. She bought many awards like gold medal during the MD, PGI, uh, IMER, Chandigarh. Also, At J and she received an Anwantari Award for Exceptional Contribution for Pregnant Women During the uh, COVID. So, with due respect to all, I would like to call upon Dr. Shilpi Sud, ma'am, to please deliver today's lecture. Thank you so much. Welcome, ma'am. Dr. Shilpe, ma'am, you can continue. Muted. Yes. 
Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, once again, thanks for giving me this opportunity to present at this very important platform where I can see very good uh, number of and good uh, topics to be discussed. I thank Nima Obijiwai Society, Central Society. I really thank Dr. Kamini Diman, Dr. Priyanka, Dr. Vishnu, and Dr. Rajesh, and all the seniors for for uh, being here and coordinators for coordinating for the same. Now, today I will be really talking about some very, very different topic. In fact, this is one of the topic when you see such patients landing them in your OPD, then you really mind get twisted what to do and what not to do. This is my past experience in last 20 years. First of all, what is the diagnosis, clinical and you can say the investigations we need to do and coming to the accurate diagnosis and challenges meeting the outcome of this particular condition where the patient usually when present with this condition during uh, in, in, for fertility treatment. So I do believe, next. I do believe the process of reproduction, including sperm transport, embryo implantation, fetal growth and development and the process of labor and birth relies structurally uh, and functionally on the normal uterus. We all know that normal uterus can only take part with such activities. So any uterine abnormalities, including the congenital anomalies, can influence such activities. While most of the patients with uterine abnormalities have normal reproduction we can say they have a normal reproductive outcome but you know you can see like uh, but some may experience adverse pregnancy outcomes although the underlying pathophysiological process is mostly uncertain coming to this background i would like to say these are the anomalies which are defined as deviation from the normal anatomy resulting from embryological maldevelopment of the Mullerian duct. You can see that, you know, knowledge of embryology to identify the uterine abnormalities and abnormalities of reproductive tract is very, very important. And what is the basic, uh, 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 like, process of formation of reproductive organ, especially the Mullerian organ, like uterus and the upper one third of the vagina, we can see the sixth week onwards, you can see like these Mullerian ducts are chosen, you know, fourth week onwards, you can recognize that primordial, uh, basically primordial follicles, they come from a primitive germ cells, which arise from the dorsal part of the yolk sac, they participate in formation of primordial germ cells and they migrate towards the primitive gonads that is going to form the ovary. And that is being selected when they realize that this is a female. There is a lack of Y chromosome. This is going to be a female. And when this female is coming up, there will be a, you can see, uh, uh, there is absence of testosterone and you will see the lack of, in fact, testosterone and there is more of AMH, which leads to further development of mainly the Mullerian ducts. So Mullerian ducts participate in formation of reproductive organs, but the Wolfian ducts, they regress. So Mullerian ducts from fallopian tubes to the part of the body of the uterus on either side and towards to the upper one third of the vagina, we understand very well. Now, sixth week onwards, there is a Mullerian duct formation and there is a formation on ninth week continues and during 10th week of intrauterine life, there is a fusion. You can see the both sides of the Mullerian duct are getting fused in the midline. And after fusion, although we can see the fusion, there is a division is there with the fusion, but followed by fusion. That is very nicely explained. There is a reabsorption that is canalization of the cavity on the 16th week. After understanding this phenomena, then we will be able to classify the system systematically the abnormalities we come across. So uterine alumnus are a challenge for the therapeutic decision-making process owing to the high prevalence and possible effect on women's reproductive health. As I already mentioned, so 
my objective learning objective for us in this particular lecture is to understand the prevalence of uterine anomalies different classifications diagnostic issues mechanism of infertility how they lead to infertility and treatment options and their outcome that has to be very well understood and that is very although up to the mark like mechanism of infertility we can understand but treatment options are really we have to be very critical you know once for all you have to decide are you going to operate or not what what will be the reproductive outcome if you are going to operate and we have to justify ourselves we are doing best for the patient we don't have to do any harm to the patient that should be our final agenda so coming to the anomalies prevalence why it is so uh, um, important to know that like we can see the generally you can see 6.7 in the general population you can see such anomalies but it increases with this in, infertile population to the tune of 7.3 and you will see like 16.7 and one of the article I was going through in the morning up to 25% it is seen between like infertile plus recurrent miscarriage combined they will present as a 25%. So this population they struggle with the end organ problem because uterus is the end organ that is the organ which is going to keep the embryo and have pregnancy. So, and also we do see the commonest is the arcade uterus is a commonly seen in a general uh, condition and we have to accurately diagnose and there is no tool to accurately diagnose and, and may lead to recurrent uh, miscarriage in the population and sometimes we are not very sure is it because of arcade uterus or something else. So, we have to rule out many other causes before really correct, correcting the arcade uterus. That is the um, uh, important point I would like to mention here and then coming to the septic uterus which is very very commonly seen in infertile population with congenite and uterine anomaly we do see many such patients we diagnose with a hysteroscope hsg and then a diagnose the 3D ultrasounds we do routinely when the patient is ha having a history of infertility with recurrent pregnancy loss. We do come across this septum because these days 3D ultrasounds are very, very nicely done and very clear with the page. Uh, and our, our radiologists, sonologists are very tuned to the 3D ultrasounds and it is a very good modality to diagnose the septic uterus. And I do believe when there is a recurrent loss and infertility doing a hysteroscopy and curing this septum is very, 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 very uh, like a good way of treating the patient where the outcome could be very good. So coming to the classification, we can see to, uh, in the year 2014, we got a AFS, American Fertility Society, which is now with ASRM has given this classification where they have categorized this into seven classes, clearly starting from the hypo or agenesis. They have said there is agenesis of uterus, vagina, cervical and every part followed by or oh, only one part, one side of the part has developed that is unique on it. Either it could be associated with communicating or non-communicating on, and then uh, with cavity and no cavity. That is the agenda. There is this is a very clear thing which we should keep in mind. Or there is a duplication. And this is didelphus and duplication, full duplication is didelphus, and half duplication is biconate, which is complete or partial. Again. Fifth category is septate. There is a lack of reabsorption. We see a lack of canalization either. It could be a complete from vagina to the uh, fundus and or a par partial one. And one ent entity of uh, class six is arcuate uterus. And there is a DHEAS exposed patient where they present as a T-shaped uterus that is a I'm a one entity. But later on, Ashire has given a different classification in 1920 uh, 2019 and they have divided in different classes like they have given a class of you know u0 user, u0 like the, that is a normal uterus u1 is a dysmorphic uterus that is t-shaped infertile other type of uterus but u2 you can see the partial and the complete septum and the u3 is the biconial uterus again 
and they uh, have talked about U4 that is a unicornate and finally hypoplasty U5. But apart from this, I must say there is, uh, uh, they have talked about the, what is important in HRA. I think my slide is, has to go down like class six followed by unclassified varieties are there. What is the difference between AFS and ASRM and HRA is like HRA has, uh, focused on the cervix also and the vagina. So there is a cervical malformation and the vaginal malformations are, are taken into that, like cervical atresia, vaginal atresia. These conditions were also talked about along with the uterine malformation. Later on, now lately in 2021, again, ASRM come up with the combined HRA and previous ASRM where they have taken uterus cervix and vaginal part together to understand the condition complete, completely and put it in a one platform for the good diagnosis of this condition. Because, you know, if everybody use a single guideline, they will have a better diagnosis, better collection of data. And for research study, it is very, very important that we should have a latest guideline in hand for classification. So classification is very much required to have a synchronized diagnosis and putting up the uh, and uh, stratify the uh, treatment also that is very, very important. Now, coming to the diagnostic tools. Now the patient may come with the clinical diagnosis of chronic pelvic pain or a cyclical menstrual pain or amenorrhea, primary amenorrhea. These are the clinical findings. We may have to do the clinical examination. We may have a clinical examination finding. If an unmarried girl, we have to do, uh, apart from a general clinical examination, the PR examination, to look for, for any, uh, like if the patient is having amenorrhea and there is a cyclical menstrual pain, she might be having a hematometra and hematosalpings and that can be done with PR examination. And, uh, and then finally, apart from these, we have to be very specific with the diagnosis by talking about the various tools. Because these days, we have very good tools. Like, you know, patient is landing up in your OPD and you are just examining. And after examination, a gynecologist can go ahead doing the sonography with full bladder in an unmarried girl. And you can simply go for a 2D scan in the first chance, like in 2D scan, you can just quickly screen the things. How does the uterus looks like? And there might be, you may have a suspicion of something in the uterus, the broadness of the funders. There is some two cavities as seen. So this is, this can be taken as a screening tool or a patient who is looking for a uh, pregnancy and presenting as a fertile, uh, infertility and we are doing HSG, we may come across some malformation in HSG like we may see a uh, bicornate uterine, diadel, uh, uterine diadelpus and these condition and unicornate shape. Uh, these are the screening tests, accidental diagnosis. But to be sure, you have to move ahead for moving ahead, you have a better diagnosis by, you can do always, like if you, you have a suspicion nowadays, we have a better diagnostic tool like 3D ultrasound. Now why it is better, it give a very uh, good picture of the uterine cavity. You can see the septum and you can just delineate the fundus and the depth of the fundus and the line. And this measurements from the corneal end itself suggest that this is a uh, case of septum. If there is a dimpling of the fundus along the, and there is a narrowing of the fundus here also, and there is a thinner myometrium at the fundus that is a diadelpus cases. So we have to uh, buy corneal cases in fact, and we have to be clear with this idea and 3D ultrasounds are very easily diagnosing and they have a very clear picture. They are less invasive and they are less costly. Why I'm talking about less invasive? Because we have taken a tool like laprohistroscopy as a gold standard for the diagnosis, but really we may not have to resort to this if we have a very good 3D ultrasound in hand. But what is the role of MRI? You know, if you don't have uh, somebody who is doing 3D ultrasound for the diagnosis, or if you feel 
like do you have a doubt like although it is a uterine malformation either it is a biconate septate or something there is a i must say like sometimes there is a rudimentary bone whether there is a cavity or not it is we are not able to clear it very finely then we may have to resort to mri in those cases sometimes it is very difficult to ascertain even in laparohistroscopy also the nodule is carrying the cavity or not and there is a communication also in those cases when there is a complex uterine anomalies we may have to resort to mri for standby confirm diagnosis so i think everybody is so clear like these tools are very very important and they are very good tools and keep the diagnosis in the hand with this tool to make your mind for the further diagnosis so i must say four tips of correctly diagnosing the uterine anomalies are know the embryology and normal culture well as i already mentioned like you concentrate while uh, designating the uh, categories formation fusion resorption accordingly you can say formation you you may have go with the uniconiate and fusion one if it is a lack of fusion that that, that is a didelpus biconate one and there is a resorption problem then you may have a septic so this clarity in mind will definitely help you to have a better diagnostic approach now second thing define the external contour of the fundus that is very very important you know on you know if you are doing um, hsd so hsd there you only come to know the in, in, uh, internal part of the cavity so there you don't have a idea about the external contour and for that matter we are going for the 3d ultrasounds and 3d ultrasounds gives the thickness of the musculature at the fundus and towards cornu so if there is a good fundal thickness and narrowing towards the cornu this is it and but the thickness which is uh, protruding inside the uterine cavity and and later on it is tapering towards the cornu and that is a case of septate uterus so for external contour is very important and we do see come across in laparoscopy there is a broad fundus in septate uterus because fundus is slightly you know get uh, tense with the septum pushing it inside the cavity and there is a broadness in the fundus being noted so that is important point when we take things in in uh, knowledge the third one is compare the fundal as i said fundal myometrial thickness to the corneal myometrial thickness so you can see this is a fundal thickness tf and you can measure this measurement tc is a corneal thickness if you uh, subtract uh, the compare these one there is a difference of 0.37 and this is here here there is a you can see very minimal thickness thickening changes that could be a arcuate uterus but a more than that uh, a higher thickness difference as, uh, will give a more diagnosis of a septate uterus if there is a um wider difference is seen coming to next point is second use of many technologies when i am uh, not mentioned that use of saline infusion uh, techniques so, so, sono salpingography can also help us to delineate uh, this condition while doing but you know with the advent of 3d ultrasounds this is also not required um for the uh, diagnosis you, you can see the very good pictures of unicorniate uterus it is a banana shaped uh, appearance of the intrauterine cavity endometrium being shifted towards one side and the single uh, cornea scene and here you can see yeah typically you can see the fundus is well formed this is a uh, septate uterus and this is a biconiate it is dimpling of the fundus uh, you can see and here yeah, this is a case of biconiate uterus so after diagnosis you have to have something in your mind like uh, whether you're dealing with a single uterine horn or if there is a single uterine horn then then always look for the rudimentary horn 
don't leave behind okay this is a unicorn yet your horn that doesn't mean but you should look for the rudimentary horn or whether rudimentary horn uterus is having a cavity or not that has to be looked into because uh, with a cavity there will be a painful um, cyclical uh, pain will be there but uh, and the external surface should be seen like widely divergent horns are seen in uterine diadelphus and even in bicornuate uterus but uh, you know in if you see the internal part you can have uh, external cleft is seen but sometimes it is a normal also if this is more than cleft is less than 1 cm that is normal uterus more than 1 cm and between less than as i said now this uh, difference of thickness is an arcuate one and if it is more than 1.5 cm like this is a septic uterus then finally, whether they are uh, a complete one or a partial one has to be a certain, like bicarbonate can be a complete or uh, uh, partial. Similarly, septate uterus can be complete or partial. And some hypoplastic uterus meiogenesis has to be seen if it is not seen and there is a persistent amenorrhea scenes and then there could be a DHEs related anomalies has to be separated out. So you can uh, create your own map. What is the clinical presentation? What are the um, imaging, imaging findings and uh, what are the difference? And then you come to your diagnosis. What, what is the final diagnosis put in your mind? Now, do congenital anomalies have an effect on infertility? You have to think on it. Now the pa you have seen the patient in the OPD and then you realize now I have to, to go for the tubal evaluation and you have ordered the HSG and the patient comes with the HSG saying a unicornate horn. What is your lookout for these patients? Then you have to go back to your history and look for the menstrual flow. What is the, uh, um, the amount of menstrual flow, scanty flow and everything has to be noticed. And uh, uh, you have to rule out rudimentary horn. I'm just giving you this particular case why I want to put your head into. Now you get biased. Here you get biased and you would like to indicate uh, like look, this is looking like a unicornate uterus and you have only one horn and the other horn is missing. And it does look that you have a very small endometrium cavity and chances of receptivity of this endometrium looks could be a little lesser than the normal one. And you definitely have definitely have a lesser space to accommodate the uh, pregnancy and the growth of pregnancy. So this definitely comes in your mind and you will consult the patient. But is it really this condition is, because of this condition she has infertility has to be certain because you do see like many of your unicornate patient do uh, conceive well and they have a, a good uh, outcome. In fact, a normal delivery patients, they even deliver normally and they don't, you never ever come across like she's having a unicorn yet, unless you do a cesarean section and during cesarean section you can come across like now okay this is a unicorn yet. there are, there are either widely placed tube or ovary in one side or there is no tube and ovary on the other side only one side of the horn and tube and ovary is seen so this is the dilemma we have and I must say in this lecture, don't get biased, be easy, do counsel. It could be a cause of infertility, have patience, keep working with the patient. I know one of my latest patient is coming with this, like I'm not biased, don't want to do only thing I told her, like if you won't conceive, I try to work out with the hysteroscopy, try to enlarge the endometrial cavity and improve the chances of, but she had one conception missed Followed by again, I I tried on her. Then again, she conceived. Now she is carrying eight weeks of pregnancy. So you must keep on trying rather on working on the uterus that can help you to have a good outcome. So what could be the potential mechanism and potential association and probable underlying causation for the infertility need to be worked out? So what a possible mechanism is 
uterine musculature fibrotic area is not allowing the implantation effect on the endometrium in its receptivity uterine vascularity might be changed and not giving a good implantation bed uterine contractility might be affected receptivity as i mentioned and these all increasing the pathology leading to endometriosis also because abnormal passage abnormal deposition of menstrual fluid in the peritoneal cavity can affect and lead to endometriosis which could be a indirect cause of infertility so possible association may exist if the prevalence of congenital anomalies were greater in infertile group compared with fertile yeah we do have this in greater in infertile group so there is a possible association fertility more likely amongst these patient who have anomalies prevalence diagnosis again but if but and all keeps on going and we have to keep on working so what is the probable underlying position is cause effect relationship so this is the cause is it really affecting the infertility has to be judged the presence of uh, we do understand they may lead to infertility is it really the cause of infertility has to be ascertained consequently treating the anomaly would lead to a improvement of infertility or not has to be judged very 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 minutely and we have to be uh, really we uh, for the patient we are god if we are doing something wrong that really the uterus will be lost for the implantation that is the point to be taken so associated pathologies what could be there coming to next point of the discussion is such mullerian abnormalities are associated, yeah. associated with urinary tract malformations also you know uh, the uh, mullerian and urogenital these are hand in hand developmental organs so any such mullerian problems may have a renal problem also to so look out for the these malformation kidney ureter and uh, the, their duplication absence has to be seen and then endometriosis and polycystic ovarian disease so one very important take home message here is such malformed uterus have a very sm sometimes have a smaller cervix and they also have a incompetent cervix so while handling such cases of sub uh, anomalous uterus we have to have cervical incompetency to be in mind and such patient who over conceives they should undergo a cervical proper cervical screening monitoring and the uh, uh, like look out for encerclage in such patients like they have it higher chance of uh, mid trimester abortions also so what could be the surgical treatment coming to very clear now you you have given a good trial the patient is not able to conceive as i said i have given a best trial to my patient who is coming for unicornate uterus but now she has conceived and i am very much alert like i need to supplement like wh whatever pathology i has mentioned like fibrosis loss of Uh, the abnormal uh, vasculature and the uh, uh, you can say contractility so for contractility i have supplemented with uh, to make the uterus silent i have supplemented her with progesterone so i have given for better vasculature and and better uh, flow to the embryo i have given the uh, uh, eco spring and i have also planning if she moves on very nicely like at 12 weeks after ng scan and screening out her baby for genetic screening and then i may look for the uh, uh, like cervical screening also cervical length has to be monitored every uh, now and then and at one stage i feel no it is a very precious pregnancy i may advise the cervical encerclage and consider for the this method so after asserting the diagnosis we may have to plan if you see like patient is not able to conceive then you have to go for the surgical method and that is hysteroscopy so what is the time of hysteroscopy is the early proliferative phase because hysteroscopy has a dual role now it will help you to have a diagnosis where you are not very sure so you will keep in mind like i may have to have a good diagnosis and side by side i'll be operating on it so may we may also plan for like if to avoid blood loss some uh, some of the surgeons also look for pre operative preparation with gnrh to have a reduce um, uh, vasculature and less bleeding and there should be better equipment smaller diameter equipments to have a better outcome 
pre operative uh, survival ripening also you can look for but these days we have a very finer hysteroscopic surgery where we don't look for the um, uh, you know cervical ripening with mesoprost and all but uh, we look for uh, if we really suspect there could be a chances of cervical stenosis there we can work on it or we should directly look into the internal os with with the hysteroscope and cut uh, they open the cervical internal os with the instrumentation that is a better idea and diagnostic hysteroscopy and primary assessment and evaluation of volume and morphology of uterine cavity is very very important look uh, up and down, side by side, osseas and all the walls and correct uh, assessment is important. As I said, in unicornate uterus, what type of surgery you will look for. So I'll be showing a few videos like surgical technique for the uterine anomaly, which is the most common as the uterine septum. You can clearly see the septum. This is a uh, uh, right cornea. This is a left cornea. And there is a clear septum, partial septum is seen. And this looks, although um, a fibrous, not very vascular, the cold scissors, I'm cutting with the cold scissor and doing a septal, uh, septoplasty. And after doing a septoplasty, you know, you can see in this video, like scissor is easily cutting the fibrous septum. The bleeding is less, less bleeding is seen. And during the surgery, you have to keep yourself in the middle, avoid going to the up and low. And at the end, your aim should be to cut up to the level where in the panoramic view, you can see both the osseous together. So this is a nice way of resecting the septum. Like you can say cutting the septum and clear the cavity and give the voluminous cavity. And what is very, very important, the after doing the surgery, you should be, um, you know, you should be well prepared. This might bleed. If you're prepared, then you can always supplement with the tranexamic acid and all. And followed by, you can do tamponoid with the Foley's balloon. Or if nothing is there, like you can sit, simply create a good cavity. And after that, if you really feel like there should not be re-adhesion formation, re uh, like um, addition has to be avoided in these patients and we have to take utmost uh, precaution in such cases. I'll be coming to those cases like how these post-operative management has to be given. Ideally, these days, now we are not going for a T placement. This is a colon knife uh, resection of the septum where we suspect there is a vascular septum, then we do a electrocautery resection. This is you now keep your instrument in the middle Keep visualizing the cavity simultaneously and try to cauterize carefully with the assessment of the depth. So such surgeries are very, very precious for our patients. And it, if any time we come across, there, there is a risk of perforation and uterine wall damage, injury is there. There at that time, we can, we have to really stop the procedure and we could not complete the procedure in the same sitting and we, then we have to come back to the next sitting after the healing of that particular wound. So we have to be very cautious, as I said, in the formation of cavity, post-procedure bleeding and then taking care of good endometrium formation is very, very important. Lining formation, earlier the simple T was placed on somebody was placing the police for seven to 10 days, but there's no need if you can give a uh, estrogen, uh, you can say you can give uh, estrogen two milligram BG doses for three months continuously, there is a growth of endometrium nicely. So this is the way we do the surgery and we try to bring up the endometrium and in further cycle, we keep on judging the endometrial growth and the response to the treatment has to be seen because after that you will see there is a very good trilaminar endometrium is seen in those cases. So, this is the surgery for septate uterus. No higher con conception rate after estroscopic metroplasty is a case. So, in a case of unexplained infertility is seen, where you realize there is a septate uterus, if you do septal resection, there is a more chances of conception. So, there is an association also with the length of septum and infertility, higher conception rate after 
after correction of complete septum is well proven and hysteroscopic metroplasty should be advisable before an IVF cycle to improve the pregnancy rate and reduce the incidence of spontaneous abortion very much. So I must say like coming to the another entity, dysmorphic uterus. So for septum, it is one or one for all like septoplasty. But what about the other uterus we do come across these days? T-shaped uterus, they, they quite often be come across when you do the diagnostic hysteroscopy in a patient to going for an IVF cycle. So there you can see the lateral wall is coming inside the cavity is convergent. So there is a tunnel shaped cavity or shall look at far laterally and, and uh, inability to visualize both ocean and a single view is seen. Now you can see the pollen line is working on the lateral wall. So sharing of this lateral wall and improving the cavity volume. You know, you, this part is cut. This part is cut on other side and uterine volume is resorted. So the idea is to uh, cavity volume is improved and that improves the chances of conception in these cases. And quite a few studies are saying this is giving a very good results in uh, further implantation. And one entity is the one being described by the Ashray. Uh, there is infantilis uterus, a very small cavity. You can see you're moving towards the internal loss and you're, there is a very tubular, it is not in fact T-shaped, it's a tubular cavity. Then good assessment in 2D ultrasound which, and the measurements of the uh, uh, muscular um, uh, the muscles, walls, and then increasing the volume by doing the lateral metroplasty on the other side and the uh, metroplasty on the fundus also. That will give a wonderful further improvement in the volume of the cavity. So this is a uterine metroplasty for uterine enlargement. You can see on either side, there's a lateral um, wall is being shared off and this, this side also. On the right side also and finally at the fundus this is it so the agenda is after doing this surgery you have to keep assessing the endometrium uh, being built up on this cut site and the covering of endometrium do come across and you have to be very particular to avoid the uh, adhesion formation so you can see the cavity is now a bit broader when you have done the Thing. And many of the time when we are not very sure about the things we in such cases, I personally believe, believe when there is a very small uterus, there is a very high chance of perforation. So we have to be particular. We may uh, um, uh, add on the uh, laparoscopic uh, uh, view also side by side to avoid any such incidences or take care of such incidences. So this is... Um, uh, another important thing, you know, you can look into this asymmetrical septum. The Robert's uterus is defined as a asymmetrical septum where you can see the right side of the cavity is well formed. This is the right side of the cavity and this is this is very well formed. But the left side, left side of the cavity is, uh, is now... Um, uh, incomplete, you know, it is not communicating with the cervix because of this incomplete septum. That is entity we should know, Robert's uterus. We do come across such condition but unable to diagnose. Now, if this knife, this knife is cutting up this, this septum. This is sharing of the septum from this to this area. So, the knowledge of the anatomy of the intrauterine part and then working on those part and cutting this septum is really a challenge here. And the assessment of the surgeon, keeping the eye on the endometrium and on the osseo very nicely will help you to do the surgery. Otherwise, it's not a very, very easy surgery to cut this asymmetrical septum because in such condition, the patient also is menstruating, but cyclical menstrual pain because of accumulation of menstrual blood in the left uterine cavity and also sometimes hematosalping. So this condition has to be noted when there is a cyclical pain, dysmenorrhea also, there is a menstrual bleeding and then you can always do the 3D ultrasound and do further investigations too.
follow this thing. So another condition is a biconate uterus is a typical of the lateral fusion defect constituting approximately 26% of uterine anomalies. We What we do that is a stress means abdominal metroplasty being described as a unification procedure, correcting the underlying defect of two uterine cornea in biconate uterus, making it a single cavity. Post-operative, either it can be done laparoscopically or open surgery. Post-operative fetal salvage is higher in these cases. It's 100% after corrective surgery was reported. Laparoscopic route is visible better in alternative to abdominal metrosplasty. Now, I can give you this picture of this stressman metroplasty, laparoscopic view or diadelphus uterus and and you can see the nicely done stressman uh, surgery is then you can see and there is a separation of both, uh, like uh, unification of both the horns has been done and truly speaking it is really far um, dangerous to see the sutures all along from anterior to posterior and we have to be very particular uh, for the patient during antenatal period for carrying the pregnancy tail term and we have to very alert in eight months when there is a high risk of uterine yeah, sutures being given away and risk of culture. You can see the post LACS, these sutures are seen here. I have taken this note because it is such an important thing to uh, look into that. Like coming to uh, surgery for unicornate uterus is annual surgical technique for trans cervical uterine incision on the design to warden widen the normal uterine cavity. You know, the normal uterine cavity is narrow and that has to be improved. To test the hypothesis that the adverse pregnancy outcome associated with unicornate uterus is related to the reduced cavity of the cavity in this group of women, we have to really put this head if the cavity is enough or not. And this uterine incision appeared to improve the pregnancy outcome in pregnant in women who are having infertility or miscarriages have been proven. So you have to just judge. And there are also challenges that with the unicornate that the non-communicating uh, rudimentary horn with Functional endometrium be removed, particularly in symptomatic women. And there is no consensus whether to remove communicating rudimentary horn or horns without functional endometrium has been given. But you have to be careful while looking into these cases. The patient may come across very acute abdomen and we have to do a, um, emergency surgeries when these patients present with non-communicating horns. And, but there is no evidence that removal of such rudimentary horn improve the reproductive outcome because those are communicating horns. They need not to be removed because they are there, but, uh, but there are chances of rupture uterus in these horns when they have a um, weakness of muscle, but has to be justified by imaging techniques and the diagnosis. But no strategy has been there to remove these horns where there is a communication. So what is the role of laparoscopy in these surgery is has to be limited. Sorry. Uh, is uh, like uh, the use of laparoscopy has to be limited to those cases with concomitant pathology that requires laparoscopic approvals like endometriosis, some fibroids or some condition or they have a complex uterine anomalies or, or it can be as a guided guidance method in case of hysteroscopic metroplastic or septate as I mentioned earlier. So post-operative strategies for adhesion prevention is surgical technique should be good uh, early second loop hysteroscopy can be done. Antibiotics should be given properly. Preoperative hormonal endometrial separation can be done. Postoperative hormonal treatment that is the most most important and postoperative antibiotics. And patient may use should go for barrier method. No early conception. Intrauterine device balloon and these are conditions being mentioned. But these days we don't use all this thing. And good hormonal support is everything. So reproductive outcome after correction is conception rate really improves up to 40 to 60 percent attributed to the improvement of the uterine cavity, morphology and volume mainly. Other factors like endometrial injury induced by biopsy or scratch or hysteroscopy also help in conception because it is being said that that, that improves the inflammation and implantation in these conditions. But there is also a risk of uterine rupture in subsequent pregnancy if we have, we have not taken care of those and in endomet like uterine injuries like perforations or post metroplasty stressments metroplasty and so for that matter 
Also, the cervical incompetence in such cases, we should have a very good, careful obstetric management to have to give the live birth pregnancies. So, I must say, I just want to share a few more of my experience. Like, what? How do we find such pa patients in cesarean section? Sixty uh, percent of the pregnancies in unicorniate and diadelphus group reached term. And uh, 60%, 39 in biconiot and 48% in septage. And, and you can see this, as I said, like uh, this is a, um, uh, you can say the horn being seen, cut often and uh, seen. This is one of my case, cases. I'm just, I've taken, and this is a biconiot uterus. You can see the biconiot uterus. Uh, and the cesarean section was done in one uterus. So now what is the call I was discussing? If it, there is a communicating cavity, whether to remove the rudimentary horn or not, it is being literature says no need. But if you, um, it's really a no need. But if it is a non-functioning, and this is known to you in beforehand, then non-functioning one has, has to be removed. Now this is a case of again uterine diadelphus. Yes, you can see the two separate cavities up to the you know uh, this vagina. You can see the two separate cavities is very very well seen. So there is a one uh, one uterus was showing the pregnancy. Now this is a biconiate uterus where both the uterus is carrying pregnancy. This is a twin pregnancy. This is a wonderful picture of today's lecture. I would like to share like two twins were delivered in both the horns. This is really a big thing and cesarean section and cesarean scar is being seen. So I must conclude my uh, uh, today's lecture like I know diagnosis simpler clinical diagnosis simple approach and a good hysteroscopic surgery and the use of laparoscopy when indicated need to be done, but not always surgery. We should not always uh, incline on the surgery. We should always prepare our patient whether she's able to conceive without anything to be done. So we must pledge here again, first do no harm. Don't treat without indication. Only do surgeries when it is indicated. That is my message to everyone. And I here I conclude saying thank you again for this wonderful giving this wonderful opportunity to me. Thank you so much. Wonderful session, ma'am. Absolutely stunning. And the uh, beauty of this session was your uh, own own uh, experiences and your uh, variety of the patient that you have shown in this platform. It was great. We have seen some patients first time like the bicornate tutors that you have seen uh, shown us the last picture that was very nice very uh, appreciating that you have a very good uh, uh, variety of the patients in your clinic also such a uh, roaring practice that you have in nagpur and we are absolutely means uh, overwhelmed with this your topic and your uh, uh, sharing experience so i i would like to request dr jagruti uh, yes please uh, take the question yes ma'am thank you Thank you so much, Dr. Shilpi Ma'am, for this wonderful and very informative section. So, if you permit, uh, we start the question and answer series. Uh, so, I request Dr. Aarti Nadar to take question and answer series. Over to Dr. Aarti. Yeah. Thank you, Ma'am. Uh, uh, please, anyone, if having any doubts, please put it in ch chat box or directly please unmute yourself and ask the questions. Uh, ma'am, uh, Priyanka, ma'am, if you have any questions, please ask. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes. Hello. Uh, I just want to hear some uh, points regarding the MRK syndrome, ma'am. If yes, you can. Yes, uh, yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, very uh, nicely. Like we do come across MRK syndrome. The, the syndrome has a type 1, type 2 varieties. Like type 1, we could see like... You know, uh, there is um, uh, the formation of ut uterus is there, like they are in the form of nodules. There is no unification is absent. So you can say the, there is non-functioning two nodules or a single nodule you can see without any endometrial cavity. That is type 1. Type 2 is basically there is this, 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 this is basically because of the absent functioning uterine cavity. So type 2 is 
no uterus basically no. uterine uh, uh, no even there is no nodule there is a absence of uterus only the ovaries are uh, formed and they are spread out widely on the lateral pelvic wall and in these cases there is also you can see the absence of the upper one third of the vagina or yeah. sometimes there is a complete vaginal agenesis. Now, yeah. do you understand like upper one third is formed from this molluorian uh, um, uh, duct and the lower one third is sinovaginal bulb, which is forming the vaginal plate and that unification of these two tubes gives the final vagina formation. Yeah. Uh, and in such cases, ma'am, whether we should, uh, means considering her, uh, means a reproduct, uh, not a reproductive, but sexual life, if we consider, when uh, we should perform the surgery is, uh, shall we perform uh, during, uh, means the marriage is concerned or when she wants to uh, have a partner, at that time we should perform a surgery or we should perform it before, is it? Miss, what should be the best? Yes, it's a wonderful question. I think it's very important. Like whenever you come across such patient, you have to see whether she's married, unmarried, and what are her prospects to go for marriage. That you know, the only thing like you have to do the surgery a uh, six months or three months prior to marriage accordingly. Like what type of surgery? Like McIndoe's uh, 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 pulling of the peritoneum. Uh, you have to do or a vaginal resection or uh, skin grafting. You want to plant or you have to go for the sigmoid pollen uh, implantation the three different types of surgeries are there depending on those uh, like those who, where we have a vaginal canal formation and the skin grafting there they need a, a more of dilatation techniques yeah. and then macando one is also need little bit of dilatation these are but um, the the sigmoid pollen one doesn't need much of dilatation can be done early but those techniques where they need more dilation has to be done six months, three months prior to the um, marriage, actually. actually yeah. And if, uh, as you say, for the complete septum, if we consider and we are, if uh, we are, uh, means uh, doing a uh, means, uh, septum dissection, at that time, what precaution we should take that the patient should not come across for uh, cervical incompetence? Yes, ma'am. This is very, very important. For, again, point. But, you know, uh, she will definitely land up into cervical. You cannot take much of the precaution. But what hmm. you can do, what is the idea the surgeons have put up and we have a discussion in our group, like you don't, you can cut the vaginal portion and then you just leave behind the cervical portion and you hmm. can move ahead doing the uh, the lower uterine and upper uterine septum cut and leave behind the vaginal septum to avoid the incompetence. This is one of the strategy being followed. But okay. we have to make sure like cervical length has to be monitored very critically. And if you okay. really if you don't want to take any risk in a patient who has already have a bad obstetric history, go for cervical length separation. Okay. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, Ma'am, the similar question according to the age. If the patient comes at pubertal age and accidentally she is find as a biconiate uterus, so, uh, should we advise uh, the plastic surgery or uh, reunite uh, united surgery uh, at what age? No, no, no. See, uh, you know, anytime when you come across biconid, you know, for this patient whom you are mentioning, like she is unmarried. So, first of all, you mm -hmm. have to see what with what condition she is presenting with you. Okay. See, if she has presented with you chronic pelvic pain or a cyclical pelvic pain or a primary amenorrhea with cyclical pelvic pain, then you have to come to a particular diagnosis. Is it uh, uh, obstructing, non-obstructing pathology has to be certain of. Like if you say it is a non-obstructing and there is a minimal pain, it could not be because of this condition. You have to rule out some endometriosis, which is associating complaints. So with the diagnosis of communicating by corneate horn, don't do anything. Just treat the condition of associated problems. Leave her. She is a good candidate. She may conceive or on it on her own. Let her get married and then have her own good time to conceive. And if she comes to you saying, I'm not able to conceive, just go for to look out other causes of infertility before really jumping into the surgery of bicornate. This is the message I want to give everyone. 
थैंक यू मैम ओवर टू डॉक्टर आर Thank you, ma'am. We have one more question, ma'am. Hypoplasia uterus choice of treatment and selection criteria for for any surgical correction, reproductive outcome. Yes, yes. You know, we do come across a hypoplastic uterus. The definition is nowhere seen. Mentioned one of the gynecologists once called me up. Can you define the hypoplastic uterus? But I have gone through the literature, and there is no real mention of the length with where we can say there is a hypoplasia or not. So we do come across our radiologists mentioning on the any uterus less than five centimeter, uh, the length and the less. You cannot only we just define with the length mainly, and there is uh, you know hypoplasia whether it is having a functioning endometrium or not. Two conditions. that the hyperplastic uterus with a non functioning endometrium is one thing where the patient might uh, present with the primary amenorrhea then we have to really look into what is the reason for hypoplasia whether the sex steroid hormone coming from the ovary is really not working on the hormones so either this is a hypogonadotropic hypogonadism we are dealing with the ovarian uh, lack of fsh lh is and there is no function ovarian function no e plus p no action on the uterus so that may land up into hyperplasia so any time hyperplasia either could be a congenital condition or premature ovarian failure where we are not able to get the estrogen and progesterone can also lead to hyperplasia so if you see there is a scanty menses or poorly performing endometrium jump on that uterus and try to feed the uterus with what it wants so it wants a estrogen basically so estrogen has to be supplemented for long ruling out other uh, pathology if she is you have to rule out other conditions like any family history of breast cancer any uh, ball stones any other um, you can say uh, like uh, these two important things any uh, like hypertension and these three things are very very important to rule out when you are putting a patient on a long term estrogen therapy but mind well don't be afraid of supplementation with estrogen they are mostly young and without these underlying condition because they already lack estrogen there is no such estrogen from ovary being given to the body so you can frankly supply this estrogen from outside so there you have to to give the long course of estrogen 2 mg tablets uh, you can say bd dose for 3 months continuously and then you see the growth of the endometrium by scanning or you can give 6 months or a year and you can in between in between 3 to every 3 3 months you can do the withdrawal with the uh, uh, progesterone also to see the uh, function of the endometrium so with long working on these uh, hypoplastic uterus where you see there is a chance of functioning endometrium coming up you can build up such patients i must say once again i want to declare one of my patient coming up with primary amenorrhea at the age of 40 she was primary amenorrhea but at the age of 40 again she lost whatever function she had in ovary there were no function i just build up her uterus that was hypoplastic uterus around 4 cm 3 to 4 cm and then i build up gradually 5 cm and she conceived with ivf with early in the donor early, earlier time if the donor um, program donor egg program and she had a twin pregnancy that was miraculous like this uterus carried up with the twin pregnancy ideally we should avoid giving multiple pregnancy they have a higher risk of mid trimester abortion so you should try doing a, a single embryo transfer or only two not three so but she was a lucky one she had a twin pregnancy and that was a wonderful case for my life very nice very nice thank you ma'am thank you ma'am Ma'am, we have another question. Like, can you please elaborate on hydrosalpinic formation reasons and infertility aspects? Uh, if you want to talk about hydrosalpinic associated with uterine anomalies, I mean to say, yeah, ma'am. Yeah. So uh, there is a high chance of hydrosalpinic formation where we That's see the question. Yeah, yeah. we see the obstructive lesions when you are coming across the obstructive lesion there is a higher chance if you have a asymmetrical septum 
or some rudimentary non communicating horn they may have the hydrosalping formation hydrosalping is a more common and the higher chance of endometriosis so these are the uh, cases where we come across the hemato hydrosalping endometriosis these are the associated pathologies it's because of the non uh, the um, uh, evacuation of the uh, secretions uterine secretions and uterine um, basically non evacuation of the uterine secretions due to obstruction uh, sorry to interrupt ma'am uh, the similar question uh, if the patient is having biconiate and unicolis uterus and one uh, one horn is uh, diagnosed as pyosalpings and not treated uh, by medical uh, or conservative treatment, then what should be the next plan? Uh, should we uh, excise the one horn or? Yeah, uh, see, pyosalpings, either it is, uh, I think it's, it's pyosalpings means uh, this is related to fallopian tube. Yeah. And the and other the horn is uh, having the uh, first collection. One of the horn, horn. is it communicating, communicating or non-communicating? Uh, non-communicating. Uh, sorry, unicolis. With non-communicating. Yes, yes, non-communicating. If it is a non-communicating straight forward, you have to excise this horn. This is going to be new sense if it is collecting a secretion either in, in the like premenstrual period, like before attaining a menor, or the young girl may come across the secretions without uh, the blood formation or uh, hematometra, but she may have a secretion which land, uh, landed up into uh, the infection. Very rare condition to have a uh, pyomet, uh, like you can say, pyometra. But uh, if you do come across, you have to, without communication, you have to excise this one, all this. Yeah. And if, the, uh, if it is communicating, then what should be the next line of treatment? See, communicating horn there, you have to see, uh, is it going to obstruct the conception or not? And what is the level of endometrium formation? Communicating may uh, basically land up into the conception also. Conception and there is a risk of rupture. Then there is always, you have to have a 2D ultrasound. You see the weak musculature here. There is a very critical uh, uh, limiting line whether this horn is a biconiate good horn or a simple horn. A simple horn means is a weak horn. If it is a weak horn, then you have to excise the horn. Thank you so much, ma'am. Over to Dr. Aati. Jagruti, we are uh, lagging with the time right now. So okay, take the questions first. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Dr. Aarti? Yeah, ma'am. Ma'am, we have another question. What about hypoplasia with premature... Yes, ma'am. Uh, we have another question. What about hypoplasia with premature ovarian failure and fertility outcome? The fertility outcome is not very what? good. Hypoplasia with premature ovarian failure, as I have mentioned already, like they have lack of hormones, steroid hormones. We have to build up this uterus. Same question with the E plus P for long term and evaluate the endometrial cavity with hysteroscopically when the cavity is good enough, the endometrium is good enough, the receptivity has to be judged on. We do give, see the function of the endometrium, whether it is coming up with trilaminar pat, uh, pattern or not. And this, uh, this is, and the endometrial blood flow has ascertained. And looking at, at all these criteria, we may try working up with the uh, outside donor program because there, there is a this is a case of uh, premature ovarian failure. So as I just now mentioned, like if we do these things, the, the chances of conception is there, but not very fair. Okay, thank you, ma'am. We have another question. Uh, Hydrosalpinex with endometriosis with primary infertility, what should be done first? Either laparoscopy or first should we do HSC? 
Oh no, uh, never go for HSG. You know you have already see yeah, how did you di yeah, you have diagnosed the hydrosalpings on sonography and endometriosis also sent on the what is the size of endometrioma? If you have a size of endometrioma more than four, four centimeter or five centimeter and there is a hydrosalpings, it is not worth doing HSG. There is a high chance like uh, there is a tubal um I can say tubal blockage with hydrosalpings, but one very important point I must say in this meeting, like patient presenting with endometriosis has a very less chance of blocked tube. They have an open tube only. They present with edematous tube. So it is because of endometriosis, this patient is having a hydrosalpings. Our first aim not to do HSG. If you really want to look for the uh, tubal patency, better do a laparoscopy and side by side you can get away with the endometriomia. Or if you feel you don't want to do any surgical step and you are very sure about the endometrioma, you can work out with the dinogest and uh, the medical management and regress the endometrioma and then you can go with the... Uh, if you are satisfied like you have done good job, if it is less than 4 cm, then you can try giving chance of HSG. Otherwise, no HSG, only laparoscopy. That is the thing. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, another question. How you treat medically to, or to grow uterus? The same question. I have given, given you E plus P. You want to know the th uh, therapy? 2 milligram BD for long. 3 months yeah, or 6 months. And if you want to give an in-between trial after three months, you add up the progesterone and withdraw and see what amount of flow is coming up. And then six months to one year, if you have enough time, you go for one year and you're satisfied. And after that, you give, give, give up the sets, give the step up estrogen therapy, like two milligram BD, then two milligram uh, TDS and or, or uh, increase, keep on increasing the dose and you will get the trial laminar pattern of the endometrium. That means you are successful in bringing up the uh, growth of the endometrium in a hypoplastic uterus. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you for this wonderful session and as well as for answering our all our doubts so patiently. So thank you so much. So on behalf of Nima OBGY Society Central and Onima OBGY Society Maharashtra body. I would like to express my gratitude to Nima Central, Dr. Shantila Sharma sir, Dr. Ashutosh Kulkarni sir, Dr. U.S. Pandey sir for the remarkable support. I extend my gratitude to our Nima OBGY Central President, Dr. Kamini Diman Madam, Secretary Dr. Priyanka Nakade Madam, Treasurer Dr. Vishnu Bhavne sir and Convener Dr. Jo uh, Raj for sir for supporting and guiding us to conduct today's webinar i would also like to thank and extend my gratitude to our eminent speaker dr shilpi uh, shilpa shudmam and who took uh, such time for, from a bishop she scheduled and delivered very knowledgeable and wonderful session. I would further like to extend my gratitude to our Nima OBC by Maharashtra President Dr. Suhas Kelikar, Sir Secretary Dr. Manoj Kaikwad, Sir Treasurer Dr. Ajay Ara. For all their support to conduct today's webinar. I would also like to thank Dr. Girish Daga, sir, for all the help and technical support. Last but not the least, I would like to thank from the bottom of my heart to all the delegates for their participation and presence with uh, and presence without them, this webinar would not have been possible and succeeded. Now, with the permission of the, all the dignitaries, I am concluding the, today's webinar. Thank you for attending and hope you you have learned and gained great knowledge from today's webinar. So thank you so much. So I wind up this session. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.